Good evening and welcome to the Aspen and PSPS COVID-19 Task Force webinar, answering your questions. The call will start in just one minute. Thank you for joining us. Good evening and welcome to the Aspen and PSPS COVID-19 Task Force webinar, answering your questions. The webinar will begin momentarily. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening and welcome to the Aspen and PSPS COVID-19 Task Force webinar, answering your questions. The call will begin in just one minute. Thank you all for joining us. Good evening and welcome to the Aspen and PSPS COVID-19 Task Force webinar, answering your questions. Thank you so much for joining us. I would like to introduce our moderators, Dr. Timothy Beer and Dr. Krishnan Chakravarti. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Over the past few weeks, about 3,000 of our colleagues have come together uh, on these webinars and to discuss really several issues. And during that time, there's been several questions arise. So tonight we want to take just a pause and go over those questions um, about several important topics. So hopefully you'll find this next 50 minutes or so very informative. We've got a panel of folks that really have great knowledge and some great views to help you through this crisis. So Christian. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, so to all of our uh, fellow physician colleagues, uh, staff, friends, I, I think uh, we want to for the folks that are in the front lines today, we want to give you a heartfelt thank you before we start this webinar for the countless service. You know, we, Tim and I, before this uh, webinar, had been talking about one of our close colleagues who had gone all the way to New York to help folks at the front line. And I think it's a testament to how important as a field we're coming together. And I think in the course of the last two weeks as we've been doing this, um, the amount of enthusiasm and energy that you guys have all shown in terms of getting these questions answered, uh, Tim and I have been really, uh, it's been amazing, it's inspiring. So, you know, we have such a wonderful group of folks today that again are taking their time and uh, putting in the effort to give you the best information possible. And I, I think uh, you'll you'll really hopefully to get more out of it. And as, as with every webinar, we've tried to do stuff with a newsletter, we've tried to get as much educational material out to you. So look out for those things um, and as always we're all accessible to you in any resource that you need so you know um, it's interesting um, Tim Tim is going to actually start on a very important question and I think um, a really important one where as we're kind of transitioning to seeing the effects of social distancing you hear a lot of actual good news happening with flattening the curve in certain parts of the states there's a lot of question on understanding well, what symptoms are we supposed to be looking out for as healthcare workers in terms of if we thought that we were potentially exposed to COVID-19. And I, I think Tim can kind of uh, guide you through the first part of this and really being careful about yourself and what are the things that we should be looking out for. So I'm going to give Tim a chance to kind of go through the symptoms that uh, one could potentially get if they were suspecting that they had an infection. No, Christian, great, great introduction. And so our friend Paul Lynch, uh, many of you may know Paul, and we hope to have him on a, a webinar with us in about two weeks as we raise money for charity. And I'll talk about that in a moment uh, for PPE for our colleagues. But Paul went from Arizona to New York City where he trained to help out in the ICUs of Bellevue. And so um, I, I pray for Paul and, and really respect his, his decision. But also many of our colleagues are wondering have I been infected? And I had a primary care specialist just yesterday telling me that she was getting calls daily from anesthesiologists, ICU doctors, and other folks who uh, had been potentially exposed and were really worried about themselves and their families. So 
here are the top 10 symptoms you may experience if you had a COVID infection and were symptomatic. Remember, many people are asymptomatic. That's why we need masks and social distancing and all those things we're doing. But here are the top 10 symptoms people present with shortness of breath. You may notice that walking upstairs, for example, uh, one of the infections here locally, uh, that was the first warning sign. When they went up this deck of stairs, they were very, very short of breath. Fever, many times above 101, up to 103. Very worrisome that could be a COVID-19 infection. Dry cough, and it's not a productive cough, it's a very dry cough and often very difficult to suppress. Uh, chills and body aches, much like the flu. So many folks who've had COVID thought they were coming down with influenza. Uh, but then there's a few other things that are less common, but often very important. And I wanted to bring those up, Krishna, because I think they're important to watch for, and that's yeah. sudden confusion. So there's been some folks who were normal uh, thinking people, and all of a sudden they had trouble remembering things, or remembering a word, or where they are, or you know what they were doing somewhere. So sudden confusion can be a first sign of COVID-19. Uh, GI problems, diarrhea, constipation, particularly diarrhea and, and nausea, though, are two two signs. Pink eye. And, and then this next one, I've had three friends develop COVID-19, and two of them had this next symptom. They couldn't smell or taste anything. And that was the first thing they noticed before they became extremely fatigued. Headache, and it can be for sometimes three or four days, you have a headache before you get fever or cough. So that can be an early sign. And then lastly, it's allergy season in West Virginia. We have a lot of blooming flowers and trees. I've been posting those on Twitter uh, to cheer you guys up a little bit, but you can sometimes feel like you have allergies and that can be the beginning of COVID-19. So these are the warning symptoms and signs of, of you know, COVID-19. Um, and I wanted to make everyone aware of that. Now in, in about a week and a half, two weeks, myself, Dr. Chakavarthi and Dr. Stan Goldback will lead a task force a uh, special webinar for fundraising where we try to continue our fundraising quest for those who are on the front lines to make sure they have adequate PPE. There'll be more details to follow. So with that, Krishna, let's go to our first panel. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Syed and Dr. Naidu. Um, you know, I, I think as kind of to my point earlier, as we are transitioning to um, a point in where there's an increased need to start opening up our different services to our patients that, you know, as social distancing and flattening the curve now transition to good strategies on how do we start triaging and tiering these patients, as well as um, impact of different types of medications that we're using. Um, uh, we would like to kind of, one of the uh, streamline of questions is maybe the first one you guys can tackle is, how do we take the procedures that we have and really categorize them into elective, urgent, and emergent based on what the CMS guidelines have told us? And what's your thought process on deciding where these procedures go? So I'll uh, either Dr. Naidu or Dr. Syed, whoever wants to start, uh, can start with that. Sure, I can start. So I, thank you, Christian, for the question. I, I think the first thing uh, to do in the situation is really try to, to bucket our cases and follow the CMS tiers as they're written, understanding that there are nuances and certainly exceptions to that rule. So, you know, the first tier is tier one, then we have tier two and then tier three. Tier three is really sort of the emergent, must be done. If we delay, there's going to be harm to that patient. The tier two group is really try to postpone, but there may be situations where you may need to do it, especially as the quarantines in your community start to extend beyond four weeks or eight weeks. And then the first tier are really sort of the elective procedures where we said postponing is okay. I think one of the challenges, however, is uh, that gray area, right? So we try, to, we try to put patients into buckets, but there are situations where their activities of daily living, their function are impaired. And as the quarantines in all of our communities starts to extend, you know, those elective procedures start to move into urgent procedures, right? Because they've been suffering for a period of time and they start to become more antsy. So if we're in a community that's been sheltered in place for three months, I mean, those, those patients were waiting that entire time with severe pain. So the pressure valve is, is getting higher and higher, right? Uh, especially as time goes on. So I appreciate what CMS did originally, but I think we're gonna have to start looking at each case individually and really understand the risks and benefits of doing these cases. That would? Yeah, I mean, I like that analogy of you say letting the pressure off. I, I kind of see my practice, at least in our institution, as all these patients are just kind of starting to bubble, you know, and, and we're gonna have to let off some steam at some point. I think for me, at least personally, I think the the um, decision to kind of suspend pretty much all of our operations over the last few weeks has been fairly easy for us to do. Uh, I think there's just been 
uh, a lot of uncertainty. We don't really know where this virus goes, but I think really where it's going to take some leadership and we're really going to be thoughtful is what are we going to do in the next four to eight weeks now? Now that we are getting some positive news that the curve is starting to flatten and these patients that were willing to wait for a couple of weeks, you know, two weeks ago, uh, those procedures will become more urgent. So I think that's where um, we really have to start to think what is going to be our plan moving forward. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of those patients that were originally in that tier two, I believe that we're really going to have to start taking a look at and treating those patients, you know, come May and June. Now, how are we going to do that? Are we going to treat the most highly symptomatic patients first? Uh, the patients where I think, you know, if we delay them any further, we potentially could, you know, um, exacerbate their underlying condition. Or do we go after taking care of the, you know, really low risk patients, you know, really healthy young patients uh, that even if we, if they do get COVID or get exposed, they, they may potentially won't get, you know, as ill, but, you know, that does nothing to stop spread um, within our community. So I think it's, it's going to be a challenging thing. Um, um, our personal, um, you know, plan moving forward is in that May, we're going to start to treat some of our more highly symptomatic patients um, moving forward. Uh, and again, it's all going to also be dictated by your local environment. So, you know, let me, let me ask a follow-up question on that. I think you both gave great answers and we're all looking for guidance. And, and I think it does really vary, vary somewhat based on your patient population and other factors in your local community, wherever you may be. But uh, there's, I think there's, I see it as two major issues. And this, this rest these two issues uh, independently and maybe start with Ramo and then go to Dawood. Uh, one is, you know, use of precious resources. So, you know, if you're gonna normally do a procedure in an operating room that could be used uh, for other things or the anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist may be needed elsewhere, that's one issue. Are you utilizing, you know, either a room or personnel that could be used uh, elsewhere to help people? And then issue two is untreated people. We have a panel a little bit later on opioids and what this may mean for that opioid issue. But untreated people, where do they go? Do they go to the emergency room? Do they go get admitted to the hospital and be with other COVID patients? So let's address those two as two separate questions, one for each of you. Sure, I can start with the healthcare resource question. I, I think that's a great question, Tim. So <clears throat> I, I think one of the first things we all have to do is really understand our community's uh, case count. And so obviously, you know, where I'm in Marin County is different than Dawood in Kansas City and is different than others in Florida and Arkansas, et cetera. So we all need to know what our community is doing and, and how they're counting their cases. Uh, we, we know what's going on in New York City. We know what's going on in New Orleans. Uh, but there are a lot of communities where we're saying, well, we're safe. You know, the numbers are very low. But the question then becomes, are we really testing them appropriately? And if you feel like the answer is yes, then great. Your data is valid. But there may be a chance your data is not valid. And you have a false sense of security about how your community is as far as this pandemic. So I would say that'd be step one, is really understand the data in your community regarding cases. Then step two is understanding the demand for PPE or healthcare resources, and then balancing that with your supply of healthcare resources. So um, if you end up doing these procedures and you know that the adjacent hospital is, is dealing with a COVID crisis, how does that look, right? So you, you really need to know your supply chain, know that the other hospitals around you or surgery centers around you don't need the PPE, and then in that case, once that equation is set, you can move forward. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Tim. We, we really need to understand not only our own center, but the entire community, the entire county, just to make sure you're not doing something where there might be help needed elsewhere. And I will say this, you know, doing those procedures in our ASC is siphoning off patients from our hospital. So one of the things we've done, I mentioned this before, is our ASC is really taking on the orthopedic trauma and fractures to keep those patients away from the hospital setting to keep them away from getting COVID or taking up resources. So there are creative ways to help out the hospital setting. Yeah, I think those are all excellent points, Ramo. And I think, you know, again, we'll, we'll probably sound like a, a broken record, but I think your local environment's gonna dictate a lot of this. I think, you know, us as pain physicians, we really don't wanna be stepping up and trying to become immunologists and epidemiologists. We have to really take the lead of our local experts in our states and counties. and when they do kind of give us the clear to start treating some of these patients, then we have to really kind of use our own ingenuity, you know, uh, accessing, you know, you know, using our offices for procedures where potentially we can avoid patients going into the hospital or the ORs, uh, trying maybe procedures that uh, would avoid patients really needing an anesthetic 
um, because you know that's going to require more PPE. It's going to happen in an operating room. Uh, we want to avoid doing anything probably at this point where you're going to do an aerosolizing type procedure or manipulating the airway. So I think things like minimally invasive uh, injections, uh, those seem like lower risk for us to do in the next few weeks to months versus other more invasive procedures uh, till we get a better handle on things. No, I, I totally agree with you, Dawood and, and Ramo. I think, you know, doing things that require anesthesia is quite risky at the moment and should be avoided if at all possible because we need those resources. Plus, you may aerolize someone by putting them under anesthesia in any fashion. So uh, great points, uh, Christian, great, great panel. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Chakravarti, uh, want to go into the next panel? Yes, absolutely. So uh, I think this actually from our um, first uh, webinar came a ton of questions behind how important telemedicine is in terms of uh, adoption, just kind of the questions specific to things related to physical exam, the coding, et cetera. So um, we have Dr. Wiseman and Dr. Naidu on this part of the panel to kind of um, address some of those questions and maybe we could start with a little bit on how you guys have integrated telemedicine and specifics on just any relation to coding and we can start with a little bit on coding because that seemed to be a kind of a focal point of a lot of the questions how's that going and what suggestions do you have for a lot of the folks watching tonight so thanks sure, for that with... oh, go ahead, yeah, go for it. no Oh, you're sweet. Um, so, you know, briefly, I think one of the main things is a lot of us were not really well equipped to jump right into telemedicine. So some of us are more fortunate that we were using an EMR that it might be built in, right? So like Athena or Epic or other big services have it built in. Um, for many of us in smaller practices or not university-based setting, having a telemedicine thing was kind of a, well, where do we get it? And luckily, a lot of services came up quickly. So um, you know, there are existing ones that use, so without sponsoring one or the other, I think each of us just found what works best for us from a usage standpoint. But the reality is, is that Medicare, um, you know, set the precedent by really backdating services, stating that, you know, um, they're going to cover services from, I think it was like March 3rd, um, and then also covering the patient's 20% responsibility. So if they didn't have like a secondary um you know, part to help them with cost sharing that they were going to not have those additional fees. And that was, I think, backdated to March 18th. But I think the big thing is everyone's worried about physical exam. And the one thing that Medicare telehealth services really identified was that they removed the requirements for the documentation um, of physical exam to justify the coding. And the time spent with medical decision making is really the key on how you decide what your coding is. So Rama, you wanna talk a little bit more about that? Sure, so uh, those are great points, Jackie. I would say that right now, <clears throat> as, as we've all gone through in the last month here, the rules have changed quite a bit and everyone's trying to scramble to figure out how we incorporate telemedicine because it's really our only choice during this pandemic. So in, in the last two weeks of March even, CMS made lots of different rule changes. All of the commercial pairs made different rule changes. Um, as you're alluding to, Jackie, I think the most important thing we can do right now in a telemedicine visit is, is simplify it based on time. Um, certainly do what you can for the medical decision-making process, um, but there is some leniency on that. So um, I think most of us are billing at the level three uh, and rarely at the level four, even, even though at, for in-person visits, maybe we're more towards the level four visits. But without being able to do that tactile in-person physical examination, you know, there's going to be somewhat of a demerit there. Uh, nonetheless, uh, document the time you spend on your telemedicine visit just to justify your, your level of coding. So let me ask a follow-up question on that, if I could, uh, because Jackie, I, and I'll come to you first on this question. Um, you know, I always, I, I never thought telehealth would be part of West Virginia, although it makes sense that it would be because we have such a rural population. And I thought it was going to be hopeless for me, but in one weekend, um, my nurse practitioner, Ashley, and my manager, Stacy, one weekend, put it together, and we were going live on Monday morning, seeing 30 patients. So I found it to be quite simple to do, actually. Uh, I think a lot of doctors are, are, are scared of it, but we adapted in one day, and really over a weekend and on a Monday. So can you comment on how easy it is to really bring this into your practice and advice you might have for those who haven't done it yet or done it poorly? Yeah, so I think the reality is is um, most of us have like EMRs where we have templates. So I, to Ramo's point, built a lot of templates that said, you know, I spent 15 or 25 minutes doing 
um, uh, you know, consultation with a patient and expanding my medical decision making so that it was already something that I could just click as I was templ templating into my note and my plan and also a consent. Um, and those are the most important things to have kind of so uh, built in. Then when we schedule the visit, what happens is our medical assistants are actually saying to the patient, you're going to get a text from the system that says to click here and you're going to activate your your webcam and and the reality is is if you're concerned about a patient not having a webcam they're they've actually loosened the laws a little bit so that patients can um even just use their regular landline or like i have some patients that still have flip phones so obviously they're not able to do a video conference um it's just not available for them but to your specific point tim i think the reality is in 2020 there are a number of programs and even in the last few weeks programs that weren't previously offering it um, you know, started offering telehealth services. So it's an opportunity for people to evaluate what's out there, see what's out there. Um, they're affordable, they're cheap, uh, they're, they're readily available and very simple to use. So it's able for anybody to kind of implement it. As you said, your nurse practitioner was able to do it over the course of a weekend. Can I make a comment just on coding since that seemed to be a recurring question from our first session? So. I'm not here to give you anyone, uh, you know, on the webinar coding advice, but one of the things I think we should all be doing is framing how we code. And so one of the things I recommend doing is creating a spreadsheet where your first column is your entire payer mix. The next column is all the modifiers for all those telehealth codes. So there's a lot of debate whether you use GT or 95. And then your next column is place of service 02 versus 11. And then your last column is patient cost share. And then go through each payer because um, if you don't have that template, you're going to code inappropriately. Like you, you might think I need to use GT every time, or I might need to use 95 every time. And that's not the case. Every payer is different in your geographic region. So I recommend creating that sort of table and then checking it every week right now because it's changing rapidly. True. And um, so one final question for, one, one final question for Ramo and, and Jackie to chime in as well. So if I see a patient today, um, well, tomorrow morning on Good Friday, and I recommend you know a DRG trial. And I did that yesterday on a patient with a severe leg injury who had a partial amputation and was in severe pain. Um, how do I go about um, if I want to get that pre-certified based on that? Uh, I had her I had her use a video camera, looked at her leg. How would I go about getting that pre-certified so she doesn't have to come in six weeks from now and see me again? I can actually get that on the schedule six weeks from now. What, what's your, both of your advice? I'll start with Ramo and then Jackie and then we'll finish the panel, but what would be your advice for pre-certification? What can we do to help that occur? Yeah, absolutely, that's a great question, Tim. I had a very similar situation. So we might be thinking for us that do a lot of neuromodulation and neurostimulation, you know, without having a physical examination, can I justify a trial? Um, and the answer is yes. And, and Tim, you know, the situation you just raised is a great one. There are things you can still do with telemedicine, with audio-visual interaction that you can document in that physical examination. So what that extremity looks like, whether it's swollen, color changes, uh, whether they are wearing clothing on top of it as far as their allodynia, you can document all of that and make the justification. I think a payer would have a very hard time denying that based on all everything that you're documenting because you're keeping that patient and yourself safe during this pandemic. Um, I have had a single pair say, you know, it's an elective procedure. Why don't you hold off? But if you justify that it needs it needs to be done urgently, like it sounds like in your case, then absolutely. No, you I'm, I'm, I'm going to schedule her six weeks. I'm going to schedule her six weeks from now. You know, so I'm, I'm yeah. not going to do it urgently. I don't think it meets the criteria that we talked about because anesthesia would be needed. I do, as you, as you know, my DRGs under general monitoring. anesthesia, with mo they're monitoring. <laughs> but I do, I do want to have it approved for her so that sure. when the time comes, Jackie, your thoughts on the same question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's completely appropriate. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of, um, you know, psychological testing that can be done through telemedicine, too. So for those patients that require that, it's an opportunity for them. They're at home. They don't really have an excuse to not get it done. Um, I know when I've been ordering procedures now that need authorization for anything, I mean, I'm having exactly what you talked about, documenting what I see on the exam so that I can, you know, demonstrate why that's needed and correlate it with image findings, et cetera. Um, I haven't really seen any pushback from the payers. 
and I and I think it's really important just to reiterate what Rama said about having the the list. Um, I keep updating my like CPT code templates and like changing them. Like this is the Medicare level three. This is private level three. And originally, like Medicare said, you know, they want the GT modifier, and they came back and said, no, we want the 95 modifier. But you can resubmit those bills and get the appropriate payment because they were down coding the payments and not paying them at the full level. And so when we started seeing them coming in at like 20, 30, 40 dollars less than what they said they were going to pay, we resubmit them. So so just be aware that if you start looking at your numbers of what's coming in your payment and it's not correct, you know, review it with your biller or make sure that you have someone that's in your billing department call and find out so you're not losing out on what you've already taken care of. Fantastic. Great answers, guys. Um, all right, so we're going to actually transition to the next panel. Um, this is probably a really important one from the perspective of, um, I think Tim and I had discussed this briefly at the end of the first uh, webinar about um, strategies for your own mental health, right? I mean, I think a lot of us, we sometimes uh, neglect the fact that social distancing, we've got a total li life altering event. And we always, as physicians, put everybody else ahead of us, whether it's family, whether it's our patients, whether um, it's our loved ones. So, um, you know, Jackie, I, I love all of the posts that you do online because it says a lot about how you've used social media to connect to your friends. But I, I think for those folks that um, are kind of struggling out there and they may not always be open to telling that to uh, folks, what resources do you think that they have? And for the folks that are on the call today, um, you know, certainly I think even uh, Tim could answer some part of the, this component of this question, but uh, can you give some suggestions on what resources are available, how you've kind of handled this part of it? Sure. So um, thanks for bringing this up. It's really something that I think is important. I think the hardest thing is that um, everybody copes differently, and some of us are really intense and really you know, great at figuring out ways to deal with stress. Um, and this has been overwhelming for a lot of people. And I think to that point, Jess is going to talk about, you know, the financial help. Um, as a business owner, when you own a business, you're not just concerned about like the financial implication of all the changes coming down the pipeline, but also how do I support my staff? How do I make sure that like my staff is mentally healthy and do they understand what's going on? Um, as physicians and business owners and part of a team, we are essentially a team leader. And it's really important that, um, you know, you are coming from a place of comfort with learning how to cope so that you can open this avenue for your team members to approach you because they're going to have a different understanding of this current situation than you are because of their education level or their socioeconomic background. Um, they might not be comfortable coming to work because they're concerned about you know, their exposure and then going home to their own family members, or you might have employed physicians or other employed staff that feel that way. So making sure that you have really clear, direct guidelines for your team is really important to help the mental health of all of your team members. And that starts with you understanding how your needs for mental health are met. So uh, one of the things that you and I have talked briefly about, Krishna, is um, you know, mindfulness and meditating. So I suck at meditating. Um, admittedly, it's really hard for me to quiet my mind because it's like going a bajillion miles an hour. Um, so for me, having guided meditations are really helpful. And right now, Headspace, uh, which is a paid application, is actually giving free memberships to healthcare providers that um, as long as you provide your MPI number, you can get a free subscription to it, which is great because it's a guided meditation. Another free app is Insight Timer, but all of these are ways that you can figure it out on how to do some medica meditation. Um, you know, if you're someone who meditates by exercising, there's a number of also free apps like Nike has an exercise app that's free right now. Um, the Peloton app is free for people, so you don't have to have a bike to do it. So there's a lot of different outlets, but I think it's really important to remember that you need to continue to massage the relationship with your team members because not everyone is going to be comfortable being open about their feelings and how scared they are or what's going on in their life. And so understanding that you're going to need to be that person that sets the example is really important right now. Jackie, I want to comment on what you said, and then I want to go to Jessica about some financial issues. But, you know, I think what you said about leadership is so critical because so many people right now are being negative. And, you know, what I've been preaching to my team and, and, and my staff is that we need to be concerned. We need to be cautious. We need to be social distancing and wearing appropriate PPE. But we also need to be uh, positive towards each other because it's a time of stress. And I love everything you said about leadership because if we're not positive, 
then who would be positive around us is we're the leader of our, of our practice in our hospital and our group. So, and uh, there's a free app called uh, the mountains. So, uh, you know, I just said for the mountains run free in the trail. So, so get out there and do some things for yourself. There was an article today from the Dutch though, that's quite concerning. It says if you're running with people too closely, that their, their COVID like a, uh, their, a their positive camp. may go behind them and maybe contaminate you. So even as running, you're probably better off social distancing quite a bit if you're gonna be running. So as of tomorrow, I'll be running alone, unfortunately, that's kind of sad, but uh, but that is an article came out today that I think we need to be concerned about. But well, then there's this other last... part, that's financial. Oh, go ahead, Jackie, and then no, we'll go to finance. I was gonna just say re so like, I'm a horseback rider and I'm really conscientious right now that like that's a dangerous sport. Um, my partner's an orthopedic surgeon, his son was bike riding and fell off his bike and broke his arm. So the reality is, is like it's okay to do things that are socially distanced, but make sure that you're not doing something that's gonna like land you in the ER or in a in a place that you're gonna need attention. Uh, I think there was a hiker that was found dead in Death Valley. Uh, uh, recently, a Kennedy like died kayaking in the river. So I mean, be smart. Don't use resources just because you're going out there to do something <laughs> stupid. So um, I'm I'm, anyway. I'm almost too I'm almost too depressed now to go on because of all these death stories. But I will say. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to make one comment. I'm going to give it back Meditate. to Christian to ask Jessica a question. Yeah. But but I got a brand new triathlon bike uh, that came in in March from a great bike store in Charleston, West Virginia, Charleston Bicycle Center. Uh, and I haven't ridden it yet because I'm afraid to ride it because I don't want to be in the in the ER or ICU. So it's sitting on my corner looking absolutely beautiful. Christian, why don't you ask Jessica a question yeah, about, uh, about absolutely. Yeah. So let me uh, preface this. Um, Dr. Jameson wrote a really nice article with uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Hunter that just came out in our last newsletter. Um, and, you know, I, I think everybody's aware of the stimulus package that was just recently passed. And for a lot of folks, and, you know, you hear this anecdotally, even in certain parts of the states like Texas, where um, small private practices are really struggling to um, keep their business afloat. Um, one of the things that came out of that newsletter, and I really appreciate it, it was a very well thought out strategy for accessing some of these uh, stimulus funds and these different loans. Um, Dr. Jameson, can you kind of maybe comment on that and summarize what your main thoughts on that and um, how that could be kind of helpful for folks that are on tonight and how they can take sure. advantage of it? Yeah, so so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, I'll preface this by saying that this is my understanding of the CARES Act and of some parts of the CARES Act, right? This is a huge multi-trillion dollar act that has a lot of different parts in it. Um, but I'm just going to talk tonight just a little bit about the Paycheck Protection Program, which I think many private practitioners are quite familiar with. And then we'll talk a little bit about the Economic Injury Disaster Loans or the EIDLs. Um, but there's a lot of other parts to this act that I think will help physicians in the future. Some of these Medicare advancement payments, these sort of things that can really come into play as well. But, but sort of to start with, I'm just going to give you, I'm not an accountant, I'm not an attorney. You should talk to your accountant and your attorney about this. But I will tell you what my accountant and my attorney have talked to me about and what our practice, our group practice, which is a relatively young practice. I mean, we're less than five years old, right? So that puts us in a little bit different category than maybe a practice who's been around for, for 20 years, right? So this has been a very difficult time for, I think, young practices and practice private practices in general. But um, that being said, I'm just going to talk a little bit about sort of that paycheck protection program. And that's really um, where there's been a lot of question, but then also, I think, a lot of, a lot of help. So the paycheck protection program is um, is, is a loan from the government, but it, it is essentially used for uh, covering the, the wages of, of your individual. So what you can do is um, you can apply for this through your local bank, and that has been an, a, a little bit of a challenge nationally because you need to have, in a lot of cases, a relationship with a bank in order to apply for this loan. But what you're doing is applying for a loan, and that can be two and a half times your average monthly payroll. So you have to get all of this data together. You have to apply for this. You have to know what your monthly payroll is. Um, and then you, you can apply for two and a half times that. Um, and and the, the limit on that is, I think the limit is $10 million. So that would be a relatively big business. But these business loans um, and, and the Paycheck Protection and the EIDL are for small businesses, so less than 500 employees. Um, the interest rates are... Let me are, interrupt for one second, Jess, because there's one thing yeah. that's really important. So some people are concerned about like their ASC. So if your like, ASC is owned by an organization that's like a venture capital fund or something like that, 
your ASC is not allowed if it's in like a big setting like that to apply for it. But if it's a privately owned ASC that you own that's like separate from your practice or a part of your practice, then it is also eligible for this funding. So that's something that's important to know too, because I think a lot of our providers are ASC owners. Yes, absolutely. And there, and and a lot of um, a lot of people will have an ALC, uh, ASC that's associated with their practice. That's a totally different um, LLC, right? I mean, that's kind of the way we do this. And so you you would be eligible potentially on both sides for for that loan. Um, the loan needs to be used for payroll expenses, and about only twenty five percent of it can be used for other things. So this is um, there's a lot of discussion about this because especially in things like the hospitality industry, if they bring back all of their employees and pay them for two months. That's not helpful because they don't have any patrons coming into the restaurant, right? So it's a little bit different for us because we're still doing this telemedicine and we're still sort of trying to get by. But 75% of that needs to go to things like wages for your employees, um, group, health, group health insurance benefits, things like retirement benefits and that kind of thing. So there's no prepayment penalty on this. And the first payment is deferred for six months, which is quite helpful. Um, other things, you you know, your business has to Jessica, have been in Jessica, business. Jessica, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Um, sure. So can you apply, can someone apply for each of, you mentioned three or four different loan programs. You yeah. don't have to pick one, right? You can apply for all those as part of your practice, like, you know, the, pay, 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 the payroll protection, protection uh, and the, the Medicare EIO. prepayment, all those things. So that's, that has been a, a big point of confusion. And I'll tell you what our accountant told us. They told us you pick paycheck protection or you pick EIDL, but you can do either of those and the Medicare advancement. And then on top of, Jackie? Yeah, that is. And then on top of it, too, I think recently on, on Monday, um, they released uh, the administrator uh, for CMS, uh, Seema Verma, said that they were going to just start direct depositing money to people who are already Medicare providers. So they were going to do 30 billion. And while that seems like a lot, I think in the fiscal year of 2018, Medicare was about a 600 billion dollar um, you know, investment in our country. So $30 billion is not really an unreasonable amount. So so just kind of look and see if you're already engaged in the direct deposit, because if a big portion of your practice comes from Medicare, then you might already be in line for that. And one of the things like Jess and I were talking about in our own practices was that if you do get that advance payment from Medicare that's separate than this direct deposit, you're required to start paying that back by in the next few months. And so the problem is, it's like we're already backlogged, right? So if you take that money and you're still billing for telemedicine and those things, then you start having to pay that money back to Medicare uh, and you might not actually have enough income coming in to really afford that repayment. So you got to think about, is it really worth it for me to bring that money and then I might get a loan from Medicare if I'm going to have to be paying it back as soon as possible? So, so maybe along that line, uh, one of the questions that is valid, I think, is what part of the loan is actually forgiven? Is there any strategy to what you're using it for that gets forgiven versus what you're going to have to pay back? Jess, you want to take that? Asked. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's the beauty of the the, the paycheck, per, paycheck protection program is that there is some forgiveness. So um, if you're using that money for... Um, for payroll, for rent, for mortgage, um, for utilities, those sort of things. Um, then, and, and you bring those, those people back for eight weeks after you receive the loan, then theoretically it will be forgiven. But the so thing Dr. Is Jameson, can I, ask, can I ask you one more question, Dr. Jameson? So again, I'm trying to ask you things I think are, are kind of confusing to a lot of folks. I'm in a practice where I have a great practice management person. He's a CEO of our company, Jeff Peterson. But what if I was a doctor without a great business person in my practice, you know, how does that person get through this process? What's your advice? Um, you know, I mean, my first piece of advice is to talk to other people. I mean, I probably have spent two and a half hours on the phone with Jackie, who has a, a practice very similar to mine in Napa, and I'm in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So I think that's, that's one thing to put your, whoever's in charge of this, whether it be the physician or whether you have someone that's kind of doing this for you in, in touch with other practices to sort of sort through this stuff. I think talking to your accountant is really important. Um, I think talking to your banker is really important. We have a relationship with our local bank and they have been wonderfully helpful in sort of guiding us through this process of the, not only the things we need, but what's the most appropriate thing for us. You know, they said for our practice, paycheck protection is the way to go. But if, you know, if you have more liabilities um, that are more expensive than your payroll, then payroll protection is probably not for you. 
And you know, like you have to rehire those people by June 30th, but if you need to spend 75% of that money on payroll, like things we were talking about where some of the people that furloughed uh, willingly so that, you know, we could keep the rest of the people who couldn't take off completely, well, they just get the benefit of getting like a full paycheck now once this we get this money and staying home as like a thank you. But, you know, we don't really want like all 50 employees back in our building. So kind of figuring out how does that work? Because if you don't actually bring all your people back that you let go and you applied based on a payroll that you had 39 employees, but two people quit or whatever happened, you get dinged and you'll end up not having the entire forgiveness of that loan. So it's really important to understand, even if you end up hiring someone that just comes and sits there and like waves at people, um, you know, from a window, really paying someone is just a way for you to get that loan forgiven. Otherwise, it's a pretty significant ding on you if you don't get it. No, I, I think you guys really have done a wonderful job and really given a, yeah. a great framing for this. It's such a complicated topic. We could have a whole whole day uh, seminar on right. it, but thank you both. And, and again, I think you asked, uh, answered a lot of questions. I'm going to come back to each of you in a little bit, though, for a summary question. So think about uh, summarizing this in a moment. Uh, we'll go to panel four. Yeah. So uh, this actually is a very interesting, another probably could be in its own webinar, probably. Um, you know, it's fascinating prior to this uh, public health issue, uh, chronic pain physicians were facing another major public health issue, which was the opioid epidemic. And, um, you know, we've kind of transitioned from one versus another, but I think it brings up a very important point on, um, you know, how does the effect of COVID-19 really uh, bring together our strategy in this new climate, in this new era of uh, an issue that has been ongoing and that, you know, we still don't have clear solutions, but we've gotten many different proposals. So uh, Dr. Prunskis and Dr. Strand, in fact, uh, Dr. Prunskis had, had sat on the NIH uh, interagency task force that was created for some of the guidelines around the different opiate recommendations nationally. So we kind of want you guys to present both sides of this. I mean, I think there isn't a clear black and white answer to this. Um, and we wanted to kind of encourage a healthy debate. So, um, Dr. Pronskis, maybe we can have you start, and then uh, I can have Tim ask some questions to either one of you also. Well, so first of all, thanks very much, Drs. Deer and Chakravarthy. Uh, I really want to extend, as I've told you both before, my thanks uh, and to the ASPN leadership for the amazing job that you guys have done, especially with these webinars. So, thank you for that. Uh, also, uh, thank you for inviting me to be a panelist on this webinar. Uh, as a, the medical director of the uh, largest pain uh, group in the Chicago area and a presidential appointee to the Health and Human Services Best Practices Pain Task Force um, and its co-author uh, of the final report, I'd like to remind all of us that procedures still need to be done to diagnose and alleviate the pain our patients are experiencing. These procedures must be performed in as safe a manner as possible, given our knowledge of COVID-19 and the continued evolution of that knowledge about this virus. Physicians need to be selective regarding multiple variables, such as the site of service. Hospitals are currently not a good option, which leaves ASCs and doctor's offices and try to follow as good precautions as possible, given the fact that some of these guidelines are changing daily. Where some reports indicate that use of some medications decrease immunity, we must be mindful that not performing these procedures may cause increased stress, anxiety, pain, and insomnia, all of which lower immunity. Pain patients who are denied procedures will potentially increase prescribed opioid usage, and if they run out, there's always the option of illegal opioids. We now know that the cartels have intensified their heroin smuggling across our southern border during this pandemic. Remember, there is still an opioid epidemic in our country, and until it was overshadowed, and rightfully so, perhaps by the pandemic we have now, it's our job to still successfully diagnose and treat these patients with a combination of in-person visits, telemedicine visits, and procedures while following necessary safety precautions, which are changing, sometimes even daily. 
A recent survey of a large pain practice indicated that patients stated if they don't get their procedures, they would go to the ER. I'm sure we'd agree that it's a bad option for multiple reasons for patients to now flood the ER. Patients will self-select as to whether they want procedures or not. And remember, we were taught in our fellowships that pain is what a patient says it is. So patients will tell you if they need a procedure, if they can wait, if they want other medications. But in, and in making our clinical decisions, we must listen to our patients, take that into account in formulating our decisions as to whether or not a procedure or other type of care is needed. I've expressed these opinions with members of the executive level in Washington, HHS, the Republican Governor's Executive Roundtable, with the largest medical professional liability carrier in Illinois, and none have pushed back on this view. Do the right thing, follow the changing guidelines, care for your patients with whatever you and your patient decide whatever is best, including appropriate procedures or opioids or other techniques. Thank you for allowing me to say those introductory remarks. No, John, I think that was great. And I, I think the points you make are so well balanced. Uh, having said that, um, Dr. Strand, um, I, you know, he makes a lot of great points. We're keeping people out of the ER. We're trying to keep people off opioids. At the same time, I know we have a population of people, some of whom are elderly, have COPD, diabetes, hypertension, and they're the higher risk group. So how do we balance what uh, Dr. Punskis just said, which I think was very balanced and nice, versus some of those higher risk people? What's your advice there? You know, I think it kind of goes back to the same strategy we spoke about in an earlier panel with who we want to do injections on. Like everything that we do, with great power comes great responsibility. And I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all answer in regards to this, you know, we talked about it. It matters uh, what resources are in your community. It matters how many people have COVID in your community. Are you on a steep part of the curve where facilities are overwhelmed? Do you even have fellowship trained interventionists in this community? What resources are available? Who is your patient? What is their personal situation? So, you know, I think as we all do, you know, in pre-COVID uh, care as well as now, a careful assessment I think anybody who was warranted to have opioids before, it's the same type of person that's going to have it now. Now, it's true that people may have less access to interventions. It's true that you may want to keep certain patients out of hospitals and conserve resources. But I think we should all remember, too, that we have to use the best judgment, just like we did before. I mean, we know that there um, was a public health emergency and that this changed some of the requirements um, from the DEA. Specifically now, you can do a two-way audio-visual um, evaluation of a patient and prescribe a controlled substance. So, you know, I think that that has been a, a great gift in allowing access for us to reach patients that would otherwise um, have the in establishing a face-to-face -face visit with a pain medicine physician. But I, I do think it's appropriate, you know, in certain circumstances. I do think it can help keep patients out of emergency rooms. It can help mitigate the things that were already addressed, stress, anxiety, sleep disturbances. So, you know, I think that all the factors have to be weighed and just excellent clinical judgment needs to be made whether we're proceeding with uh, medication management or with interventional therapies or a combination. You, you two are so balanced. I feel like I'm watching a uh, very friendly debate. Uh, so I am going to bring up one controversial point to finish this panel up, because, and then we'll come back to both of you a little bit later as we got 10, about 12 minutes left to go. But John, here's my question. There was a recent article written uh, led by my friend Steve Cohen, who is a, a phenomenal asset to our field, a bit, a, a Johns Hopkins, who I love. And Nellie, you were part of that. So I'm going to go with John first and come back to you. And one of the things that, and I think the article overall was well written, well balanced. It was a multi-specialty article. Having said that, there was one part that said that opioids could be a great solution for acute and chronic pain in this time when people couldn't get in for procedures. It also said that some of the problems we had in the past uh, were caused by lack of treatment of pain, including socioeconomic problems. And, I, and in West Virginia, I saw the opposite. I saw opioids as a cause of socioeconomic problems, not not an underlying uh, reason. So there's that, there's that, you know, do we use opioids now to keep people out of the OR 
or do we use the operate the procedure room urgently to keep people off the opioid? So John, give you a minute to respond to that and Nellie for a minute to respond to you. Well, it's it's really it, it's uh, being a doctor discussing with your patient what needs to be done. I, I think uh, you know patients will have an idea if, if they want more opioids, uh, if they want a procedure, uh, what, they know that they know what their pain is. Uh, we can't assess what they're feeling stress wise. How we you, we can ask them questions. Are you sleeping? But really, the patient inside. Is, is a great resource, not the only resource, we have to be physicians as well. So I think uh, we can use opioids, the dosage uh, can be increased because patients, some patients say, you know, doc, I just don't want a procedure to, for the next month. And you have to respect that. And so then we have to look at options and it might be opioids and, and I have no problem with that. Uh, Natalie, your thoughts? You know, I, I think um, it depends I mean, as we're all saying, it, it depends. Does the patient have severe pain that would largely be alleviated with a procedure? Or does the patient have multiple pain generators that may respond um, less to a procedure and medication management, specifically low dose opiates, may give them an excellent quality of life? So, you know, I, I think every situation is just so unique. I certainly do agree with the statement that opioids can be a bridge um, for patients who are high risk for procedures or who may not benefit from procedures or who may otherwise present to the emergency department. Um, but I'm not forgetting the opioid epidemic and you know, continuing opioids is one thing, starting opioids is another thing. You know, certainly we have to keep in mind patients age, you know, a young person might be at more risk for um, opioid dependence and abuse long term, potentially in lower risk for a procedure or vice versa, somebody who's been on low dose opiates for a long time and never had problems with escalation, um, maybe a lower risk, but a higher risk patient for a procedure. So I can definitely debate both sides of the argument. I, I think the thing here is to just act responsibly and not be afraid um, to use medication management in the short term if you feel that is the best option for your patient to improve their quality of life and keep them out of the emergency room. Wow, those were such balanced, Krish, those are the yeah, best answers. Both I of them were amazing. I mean, you're very balanced. I think what you said, if everyone on this webinar, and there's uh, several hundred people here and we'll have more tomorrow, uh, but th those were balanced answers. So thank you both so much. I'm very impressed. And yeah, we'll be back to you the, in, in a moment. We have 10 minutes left on this webinar. We're gonna ask each of our panelists one question, starting back with panel one. We're gonna ask you to summarize your thoughts. So Chris, you wanna start with Dalwood and Ramo to get final thoughts on their, their points, sure. and then we'll go back to each panelist. Perfect. Dalwood and Ramo? Sure. So, I mean, I think probably my biggest advice for everyone at, at this time is that this is just a fluid situation. You know, there is nothing that we can say on this webinar that will, I can guarantee you that it's probably gonna be outdated within a week, if not even less. So you really, this is the time to be engaged. There's, and besides our society, there's a lot of wonderful societies out there that are putting out guidance and recommendations, but you have to continue to kind of follow the guidance and recommendations. It's gonna change from week to week. And I think we're in this period of, you know, we're, we're, we're told to be socially isolated, but what I found is this is really a, a really spectacular time of, uh, community engagement and communication. So I think we need to take advantage of that. Do not, this is not the time to be in a bubble and do things in your practice without communicating with your colleagues and what everyone else is doing. So I think really that's the, the big take home point is just look at this uh, on a week to week basis because it's gonna continue to change. Uh, and those of us that will, will, will survive this and come out better on the other end. Great, great, great. points, Ramo. Yeah, I would say that for every epidemic and pandemic that we endure, we learn a great deal in medicine. And I think this is no different. I think, you know, forcing all of us to go into telemedicine, for, forcing us to think about different ways of communicating with patients, understanding the, the roles of PPE and ventilators and healthcare resources in our communities is really gonna make us all better. So I would say, as I would say, get engaged, really understand this problem. We're all we're on the front lines in a way, even if we're not the nurses and doctors who are in the ICUs taking this on. Uh, when we come out of this, we're gonna be a totally different way of practicing medicine. So I encourage you to jump on to telemedicine if you're not already doing it. I encourage you to think about how you're gonna re-enter your practice because it is gonna be different than what we've been doing in the past. Very good. Um, Jessica um, and Jackie. 
your last, your, your final thoughts, summary thoughts? Um, I think the most important thing is, again, to make sure that you are, you know, um, doing those personal touches with your team members, with your family members, with your friends, you know, use this opportunity. We all went into healthcare because we want to help people, um, you know, so help yourself first by doing some of those things that make you feel better, meditating, relaxing, uh, exercising, but simultaneously making sure that you keep an open line of communication for the people around you so that they feel comfortable uh, emoting and expressing their needs during this really difficult time. And really make sure that you are coming from a clear uh, area because it's such a fluid time like Dawood and Rama were explaining that you know, our ideas about what we're going to do can change from day to day. So where yesterday we might have been doing procedures and today we're not doing them, it's really important that you explain to them why or why not those things are changing. And so everybody feels comfortable and good and never coerced to do it, whether it's the patient or your staff member, that no one ever feels that they are pressured to do something that's out of their comfort zone. And I would just say that, you know, these are very difficult times for everyone in, in so many different regards, but they're difficult for private practitioners and they're difficult for hospital employed physicians as well. We're seeing hospital employed physicians giving pet salary cuts and, and losing their jobs. So I would just say that, you know, there is assistance out there and, and we really should use it. I mean, we, we really, the longer this goes on, the more difficult this becomes. And so find someone that you trust, whether it's in your community or whether it's in you know, the, the Aspen or the PSPS community at, at large that can kind of help you navigate and just kind of give you their insight on what they're doing from a practice management standpoint. Um, because I think that, that the help is there and, and you just have to know how to, how to tap into it. Oh, great, great points. Now, Natalie and John, your final thoughts? I think for me, um, you know, everybody has kind of captured the sentiment, but it's really a time to focus on resilience. Um, fostering wellness when you can, whether that's taking care of your body, practicing the mindfulness as discussed, you know, avoiding negative outlets. It's really easy right now to consume a lot of negative information, and it's really going to take some mental discipline to focus on um, action instead of anxiety. But I think it's a discipline that will yield benefits um, tenfold. So, you know, focus on finding our purpose. Remember why we went into this um, we went into this to be proactive. We went into this to help others. And even though we are having to reinvent ourselves right now, we still can help others. We still can be relevant. We still can connect with our meaning. And so I think focusing on that resilience and going back to maybe the roots of why we went into medicine in the first place may offer a source of strength and refocusing to those of us that are struggling during such a trying time. A wonderful points, John. Okay. Uh, again, earlier, uh, Dr. Chakravarthy uh, allowed me to say a few words about uh, something that, that I've been working on with some other physicians, and it's now snowballed during this COVID crisis. Uh, there um, is now something that I'm, as I said, working with other doctors and creating a consortium of affiliated high-level private pain practices. Uh, we're creating this uh, con consortium. It started as a concept with a few of us a few months ago after the HHS report uh, best Practices Pain Task Force was published. That report, as you may recall, was endorsed by 100% of every medical specialty in the United States. And um, when it was released, we heard from uh, patient groups uh, that this report is great, but how do we find a doctor who follows this report and, and, and utilizes best practices? So uh, we're putting together a multi-state consortium of private pain practitioners. And again, this is snowballed, especially in the COVID crisis, the interest has really peaked. And um, these, these groups that are coming together were each uh, undergoing a rigorous analysis of compliance, billing practices, uh, reviewing appropriate opiate use, clean background checks, and with a focus on patient-centric precise diagnosis and treatment of painful conditions. And um, the model that we've adopted provides autonomy, problem solving, of the, uh, between the fellow consortium members committed to each other's success and support. And so um, they, I just wanted to briefly mention it and thank you, Dr. Chakravarti, for allowing me to mention that. And if, if you're in an independent practice group, feel free to reach out to me, I'm easy to find. Uh, John, that's a, that's a great point, great resource. Thank you so much. Dawood, I think before Christian and I close, you want to make a few announcements. So Dawood Saeed. 
Yeah, I'd like to just take a few moments to appreciate our sponsors who have really, you know, helped. Uh, they've really stepped up and uh, given us the financial uh, wherewithal to be able to to pull these off. Um, our previous sponsor was there on that slide. Uh, they have a telehealth enabled pain management EHR uh, system um, as well as Medtronic has really been very generous and they have uh, another webinar focused on uh, telemedicine next week uh, from the time listed here. Uh, and I'd like to give a teaser for our next webinar from ASPN um, that will occur next week, uh, same time, same place. Um, and we're gonna take a step uh, away uh, from COVID a bit and focus on clinical. I think it's time to, for us to use this time to you know, sharpen our skills and see what's kind of uh, out there. So we're gonna focus on the evolving role of a peripheral nerve stimulation, looking at various techniques, indications, and literature. Uh, Dr. Deere and myself will be monitoring that session. Uh, we'll have uh, several notable uh, faculty from uh, across the country uh, who are gonna participate. So I think it's gonna be a great session. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'll give it back to you, Tim. Great, Krishna, Thanks. any final thoughts before I close? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, I, I think uh, Tim would agree in the last three weeks, um, it's really inspiring. You know, we talk about uh, individual leadership, but maybe the the real term is collective leadership. And I, and I, I have to say that, um, you know, this is a really amazing time for our field to really unify around something that very, you know, in a generation of 100 years, something has happened. And I, I think it speaks to the amount of uh, enthusiasm. And I, I think one take home point that I, I really want to emphasize, and I think uh, Jessica and Jackie was saying this, at the end of the day, there isn't, it isn't difficult to text somebody. I text him all the time, and I'm sure he gets uh, hundreds of texts every day on questions. So the point in that is nobody's alone. I, I think all of the folks that are on this panel, they are rooting for you. They're, we know that you're going through tough times. You got to just ask for the help. We're there. And that's part of beyond the webinars. That's really what builds the unity in our field and the cohesion. So um, we've really enjoyed trying to get you all of the educational material. We'll do our best to keep making, updating it as we go forward. But a real special thanks to our panels today. I mean, I think they've taken the time to read up on all the material and stay up to date. So uh, a big credit goes out to them. Tim. So, so final thought, uh, Krishan Chakravarti is the, the chairman of our COVID-19 task force. He's amazing. So Krishan, thank you so much. You, you've done so much to try to get us aware of what we need to do for our patients and each other. And so your leadership has been uh, amazing this time. I would say thank you for your leadership as president of Aspen. The last thought would be be kind to each other uh, this weekend. It's a, a holiday weekend for many of us uh, and a religious weekend for several uh, from different religions. So I ask you to be kind to each other and, and really cherish the moments you have together. And uh, please lean on us, you know, let's lean on each other. It's time to lean on each other and let's get through this. We're gonna, we're gonna next week, we're gonna start a CME program. It'll be PNS and SCS and DRG and intrathecal drug delivery and SI joint and uh, spinal stenosis. We'll be doing that each week. And when this COVID's over, I think we're gonna continue to do this because it's so good to get together like this and in this type of format. So uh, I think this is the beginning of a new era in uh, using webinars to, to, to really connect. So thank you for coming tonight. Uh, have a great weekend and, and God bless everyone. And especially God bless those in the front line uh, trying to help save lives. Yeah. So good night. Great